Well, I might say good afternoon to everybody who's joined us to so far. It's uh, 2 30, and uh, this is the Neighbourhood Disputes webinar for Law Week run by Dispute Settlement Centre Victoria. So um, I always like to uh, start uh, these webinars by acknowledging the fact that I am sitting here on Aboriginal land. So I pay my respects to the uh, traditional custodians on the land on which I'm sitting, the Wurundjeri people, the Kulin Nations. And also I'd like to acknowledge any Aboriginal people out there listening in and pay my respects to uh, their elders past, present and emerging. So this Friday afternoon, we're uh, addressing the popular topic of neighbourhood disputes and at the Dispute Settlement Centre Victoria, we get quite a few of those over 20,000 uh, contacts a year, of which about 75% are in relation to people who have some kind of issue with their neighbour. And a good two thirds of those uh, approach their local government first for information or advice. So today I've got uh, two guest speakers, uh, which I'll ask them to introduce themselves now. And we have um, Sarah Reid, Hi, um, my name's Sarah Reid. I'm the Regional Manager for the Dispute Settlement Centre in the Hume region. The Hume region is in the northeast of Victoria. We cover 12 local government areas up, up in that area. I've been with the Dispute Settlement Centre for nearly 10 years at this stage. Thank you, Sarah. And Michael? So this is Michael Somerville's by name. I'm the coordinator of Community Laws at the City of Monash, which is one of the Metropolitan Councils um, in Victoria. Okay. Now, um, what we'll do today is we'll have a bit of a discussion. I'm going to run by our panel some common scenarios. Uh, some of them are actually <laughs> problems I'm experiencing myself in a way. So I will uh, give the, that scenario both to Michael and Sarah to say, when would it be kind of a thing that I might approach my local council? And when would it be the kind of thing that I might... Um, approach the Dispute Settlement Centre, or is it something that actually both may be involved? And uh, just to let our participants know, we are recording this session, so it'll be live on our website after for people who missed the session. But if you have any questions, use the uh, question and answer facility, and we do have a, uh, a host who's checking the uh, Q&A as we go along. So if there's a question that might fit in with our discussion, or otherwise we'd save some time at the back for questions as well. So I might start with my first scenario, and I should also give a proviso, by the way, that um, this discussion is not legal advice, but rather we're looking at the processes, which services might be best uh, to approach when you've got a, a particular problem. So the first one has to do with uh, my wooden fence, which uh, it's about, I can see it just here. It's um, about 1.9 metres high, and it's, I don't know how old it is. It was here before I moved into the house. And... Uh, it's standing, but it's in fairly rough condition. Um, it's a bit rotted, the palings are a bit loose, and my neighbour has a Jack Russell Terrier, and it runs up and down, um, it gets very excited, it chews a lot of the bottom palings. I think it wants to get into my backyard, and that might be because I have children. Sometimes it might want to play with them, but it might be actually angry and aggressive. I'm, I'm not quite sure. So if I'm looking to replace a fence. Are there any rules or regulations about a fence that I need to be concerned about, um, Michael? So typically, fence, boundary fences um, are a civil matter. However, there are circumstances where building controls can apply, as can planning controls. So it's really important that, to check with council to understand whether or not uh, such controls do apply and so that you're moving forward with your neighbour uh, in the appropriate fashion. Right. But if it's not, if uh, I'm going with a, a, the, the same fence, like a standard two metre fence, um, there are no building controls, then it's just a structure on private property. That is that correct? So then um, I guess it's something I need to talk to my neighbour about. Uh, Sarah, is there anything else that I need to know about the rules in relation to fences? Yeah, so the Fences Act deals with um, the rights and responsibilities in relation to dividing fences between properties. Um, in essence, 
it, it basically has a scheme where each party is normally equally liable to contribute to the costs of what's called a sufficient fence because the Act covers the whole of Victoria and obviously fences vary right across from a rural fence right through to something much fancier. Um, it doesn't set out any specific details. Instead, it talks about looking at a number of factors. There's about nine factors that you look at to decide what's sufficient in your context. Uh, they include such things as what's the existing fence that's there, look at the neighbourhood around, consider privacy, look at any um, covenants that are on the property. So a lot of the newer estates these days will have a covenant where the developer has asked that the fence be of a particular height, colour and make. Um, so again, that might be relevant. So the first step though, is you do talk to your neighbours and the Act assumes that you do that. And if you can get agreement with your neighbour on what's to happen, then away you go, unless you're going to build something which does need a permit. Um, if you can't agree, then there's a process by which you can serve a formal notice defence. So it's a notice setting out exactly what you're proposing. You serve it on your neighbour. They then have four weeks to respond. Um, if you still can't agree, so if the neighbour then objects to what you're going to do, you again need to try and resolve the issue yourselves. And that might be where we can assist you at that point if you want some outside assistance in trying to sort out an agreement. And ultimately, if you can't agree, then the Magistrates Court is the place that has jurisdiction to make a decision. Okay, well, I definitely want to, don't want to take it to the Magistrates Court yet. Uh, I, I want to talk to my neighbour about this fence. Say I, I have had a chat to them and they say, look, it's great. Yeah, we definitely need to replace that fence. We're worried about the dog. Um, what we actually want to do is put tin all along the, the length of the, uh, the fence and, and dig it right in under the blimp board. And I don't particularly want to pay for that additional cost. Is there anything I can do about that? So again, it goes back to what's a sufficient fence. Um, mm. If what you've got already there is in fact a, a paling fence, it may well be that that's sufficient. Um, and there's a bit of interpretation here. So no one can give you an exact answer except a magistrate. And given that you want to avoid that, you sort of have to do your best to work it out. But if you think that a wooden fence would be sufficient and they want something that's going to cost more, then that can still happen. But it might be that you would just pay half the cost of the sufficient fence and they pay the additional cost. I'd also say to you, though, have a think about whether you want to actually go with the strict requirements or do you want to think about it also in terms of your relationship with your neighbour because if you're able to assist them with, with their concerns this time then they may be more helpful if there's an issue that you want assistance with next time and for example in that example you gave where you're talking about the something other than wood at the bottom quite often that's the first bit of the fence to go. So it may be that by having that metal bit at the bottom, you'll actually get a longer life. And so you're getting a benefit as well as your neighbor. So again, it's a matter of negotiation, but generally speaking, the obligation is to contribute to a sufficient fence. If someone wants something fancier than that, then they would pay the extra. Yeah. Well, the interesting thing is when we had that discussion, um, my neighbor said, well, you know, if Chubby gets, that's the name of the dog, if Chubby gets through the fence there, that's your, you know, that's your fault. And I was thinking, Michael, is that right? What's, what's their responsibility in terms of the dog? The relevant legislation being the Domestic Animals Act places the responsibility on the dog owner to secure the dog to the premises at all times. Um, when it's uh, obviously, it's gotta be under effective control once it's off the property. Um, but once, if it does get through the fence, then it's the owner's responsibility to, to um, avoid that. And if it does go through the fence, it's the owner's responsibility should it bite someone. Right, okay. So um, so that's, I guess, good to know, but I certainly don't want Chubby to, to come in and, and bite someone. So maybe I will have a, a chat with them about that. Now, um, while we're sitting and having our discussion about the, um, the fence, I noticed this time of year, my yard is really dark. It's like dark and covered. And it's because my neighbor has this large, I don't know how big it is, about maybe 20 meters. Um, it's an elm tree. And uh, it, it annoys me for a couple of reasons because one, all the leaves blow into the backyard. But the other thing is it does cast the yard into a bit of shade. And I was wondering, Michael, are there, if I call the council, any rules or regulations you have about what people can grow in their yards? 
Yes, David, look, um, trees on, on private property can be affected uh, by planning, uh, planning controls, um, and, but they can also be affected by local laws. So, and, and trees can also be on a, on a register, in which case there are, there are controls around the trees. Um, so it, it's always a good idea to actually contact council to understand what the position might be. Right. And that's that's specific to the council or to the to the area, isn't it? There's no yes, yes. It, it can it can vary from from depending on where the property concern is located. All right. Well, in this instance, Sarah, if um, if I've called the council and it turns out that it's not on a register, it's just a regular old tree. Um, can I make my neighbour cut that tree back? So trees, I think the first thing to say about them is that probably the, the legal position around them doesn't match a lot of people's expectations. Quite often people will take the view, well, if someone's planted a tree, they've got a duty to maintain it. There isn't anything very specific that you can point to that says that's the case. Um, what you do have is a right to try and assist the situation yourself. So it's called a right of abatement. You can trim an overhanging tree back to the fence line, but not beyond. There may be issues with that. So obviously, if it's a very large tree, you might not be able to do it yourself. You might need a contractor to come in. Sometimes the amount of branches trimmed off, etc., you know, is, is a massive pile. You can give the branches back to your neighbour. You can put them over the fence because technically they belong to the neighbour. Having said that, I suppose our experience at Dispute Settlement Centre is if you do that, Quite often, the neighbour will not be particularly happy, even though you are doing the this you know thing that you're supposed to. So again, we would say talk to your neighbour and try and sort it out. There is a legal yeah. principle. Sorry, Michael. I was going to say I've, I've heard of cases where we have neighbours playing effectively tree branch ping pong, where one throws it over the fence, the other throws it back, they throw it over again, and you know that could cause damage. That could actually you know create new problems. Absolutely. And certainly that ping pong does occur. And I guess if you look at it from the neighbour's point of view, they've come home and found this massive pile of branches, perhaps without consultation in their yard. You can understand perhaps why they're a bit upset about it. But again, it's about communication. So we would say even if you're going to do a bit of self-help, do, do some abatement, have a chat to your neighbour and just let them know. Um, they might say, look, you know, quite happy for you to get rid of them. Or they might say, can you put them in a particular area? Um, if you feel that that's not a solution, and, and sometimes it isn't, trying to get a negotiated agreement with your neighbour is probably the best way to go. The legal remedy which applies is an area of law called private nuisance. So it's an area of law developed by through cases over many hundreds of years. Um, and it's quite hard to predict the outcome. Um, essentially what it's about is if one person is using their property in a way that unreasonably impacts the neighbour's use of their property, then there may be a right to get an order from the court for them to take action to stop that unreasonable interference. There's a lot of interpretation there on what is unreasonable interference. So something that can be quite upsetting in terms of, you know, I've got to clean out my gutters um, every autumn and it takes forever and I'm, you know, getting older, it's hard to climb the ladder, etc may not be enough to meet the legal test. So again, trying to sort it out directly is probably the best option. Um, and it might be, for example, if the neighbour is willing to cut down the tree, but the cost is the issue, it may be better to think about contributing to that cost because going to court is likely to um, cost a whole lot more than, than contributing. Right. So the situation with the tree is very different from the situation of the dog. Um, if, if the tree leaves, if the leaves fall on my property and circulate around, they're not absolutely responsible for that. It would depend on what is considered reasonable. We'll expect some leaves to fall in autumn, but it's a question of if it was an unreasonable amount. And that could be very subjective. And yeah, well, and it, it's probably even, probably even more complicated than that. It's, it's unreasonable overall. So if it only happens once a year in autumn, there'll be a real question about whether that is unreasonable, even if it's a whole lot, um, because it's not an ongoing thing. It only happens once once a season. So it is a pretty complicated area of law. So we don't provide legal advice. We would say to you, if you were looking to go that avenue, please get some legal advice. Um, it is pretty complicated. 
Um, there was a, a Law Reform Commission report and there may be some changes to the law in the future, but at the moment that, that isn't underway as far as we're aware. So it's the, the, the current situation at the moment is you would have to look at pursuing a claim for private nuisance. I guess what I'd be pinning my hopes on is the fact that if it's causing me a problem, it might be causing them an even bigger problem. And if, you know, we can work together, they'd probably be happy to have someone to help uh, prune it back or do something like that. But I guess the thing is it's on their property. So, you know, I have to get um, uh, permission to come on. I can't just step onto the property and do that. Yeah, and that's why the abatement um, principle, you can trim to the fence line, because of course, theoretically, you can do that from your side. Um, again, it depends how practical that is, but trying to sort it out by agreement is going to be the, the best solution. Um, and also it gives you the chance to find out, is there any particular reason that they don't want the tree trimmed down? Do they value the privacy? Is it a tree that's got a sentimental attachment because it was planted by you know, someone that they cared about and, and it's a reminder of them, et cetera. So it's probably best to try and find that out in advance before having a very upset neighbor. Yeah, yeah. Because well, while I'm, I'm talking to him, there was something else I wanted to raise, which was um, he tends to make a fair bit of noise. And I think part of that is because he's a car enthusiast and he has actually about two or three projects on the go. And um, he often, usually it's, you know, it's on, on the weekend. Um, he's out there, he's got the compressor and, um, you know, sometimes he's revving the engine to make sure that, that it works effectively. And it's actually, um, you know, it's, it's quite annoying. And I was wondering again, if there are um, rules and regulations around that kind of thing. I mean, I don't mind him having a hobby, but um, you know, when it's, when it's that loud, it, you know, it, it hurts the ears. Uh, Michael, is there, if I, if I contact the council, is there anything they can do? Yes, David, uh, council can assist in those circumstances. Primarily noise is regulated by the Environment Protection Act and the regulations. Um, Reasonable noise can actually occur at any time of the day, but the law is um, under the, the Environment Protection Act and, and regulations. It establishes certain times when prohibited activity that causes so for certain um, apparatuses or devices, tools, um, music um, is, is there's prohibited times established, and that's generally at night, overnight, early morning. Um, so that's something that council can assist with beyond um, our, the after hours, um, beyond our normal working times. Certainly the police can be contacted, uh, then they, they may be able to assist in, in the after hours time slots. Yeah. Um, I, I, might add, I might also add that, uh, that in certain circumstances, uh, noise and the activity that might be generating the noise um, can also be controlled by planning laws and planning permits. Uh, so, that, so there's another consideration uh, as to why someone might consult council. So you're saying like if it's a residential area and he's actually, you know, running a, a, a mechanic shop in his backyard, there might be something around that. For example. And what about, because um, I mean, some noises I think would be easier um, to regulate than others. So if you had like a really noisy air conditioner and it's running all the time, you can always hear that and somebody can come over and see that. But if he's working on his car uh, and you know, that's sort of, it's some Saturdays and not other Saturdays. When do we, how do we catch him? Well, it's, um, it is difficult to try and um, catch them to try and prove it. Typically you would, you would want someone witnessing that someone either uh, recording a, uh, audio or visual, um, but it's, it's um, you might also have someone that would take uh, photos, they might have CCTV that happens to capture um, a lens that captures that activity. Um, you've also got your own observations, um, in which case you would, you would need to work with the authorities, um, whether that be the council or another authority, by way of making a statement and, and being involved uh, in the enforcement process. Right. So it wouldn't be just a case of the council just coming over and slapping in with a fine. They've actually got to gather evidence and we've got to sort of prove that it's actually unreasonable. Yes. Um, it, it, it's an investigative process that primarily has to establish that the noise is unreasonable. Right.
So that would, I guess, um, cause, you know, I, I don't necessarily want to go down that track. So Sarah, if, um, if I'm having my chat to my neighbor about my fence and tree, um, what about the noise? What would you suggest I, I do with that? Because I don't want him to give up his hobby. I just don't want to hear loud revving at, you know, two o'clock in the afternoon on a Saturday when I'm having my barbecue. Yeah, and so noise, I mean, noise again falls under the area of private nuisance. In some cases, noise can amount to a private nuisance. But it's a bit like each of you is just trying to do things that any person would feel is reasonable to be able to do. So you, it's quite reasonable for someone to want to have a barbecue in their backyard. It's quite reasonable for your neighbour to want to do a bit of his hobby. The problem is when you're each doing your thing, there's a clash between your entitlement to do those things. So it is very much about trying to sort out a reasonable way so that it's not about stopping one person or the other, but trying to find a way that you can each do what you need to do without causing too much, too many issues. So again, we would say, start by talking to your neighbor. Um, obviously quite often, particularly with noise issues, I think people will have stewed on it for quite a while because they've sort of thought, oh, well, I'll see if it goes on or not. And so when they actually go to talk to the neighbor, quite often they're quite steamed up and what comes out in their talking to their neighbor is, is quite a lot of sort of, um, distress and, and, and pent up frustration will come out. The neighbour might not have even had any indication that this was coming and so they're quite often taken aback by the, the force with which they're, they're hearing about this issue. So I think if the first thing is to think about, okay, can I make a time with my neighbour to have this discussion? Certainly you need to explain to them what the issues are from your point of view and we find getting people to explain what the impact on them is, is really powerful. By the same token, it's a matter of trying to listen to the neighbour and understand what the issue for them is. So why do they like doing this? You know, what are the reasons they're doing it at particular times, et cetera. So if people can exchange as much information as possible, then probably what you may find is a way forward where you might say, well, look, it's not perfect, but, you know, I can live with a bit of noise some of the time if, if you know, it's not happening when it really counts for me. So it's about sorting out a reasonable uh, way forward for both of you because again you've both got the right to do what you're doing the problem is that they clash at the moment right so you want to say rather than me saying you've got to stop that noise or that's a real problem me saying oh look the other weekend I was having a barbecue and I don't know if you realize this but when you're revving the engine it's actually quite loud in the yard what can we do so that doesn't happen again um, so ask him and say, you know, what can we do rather than what can you do? So that might make him less defensive. Yeah, and it's that problem-solving approach. So treat it as a problem. So rather than attacking the neighbour for, you know, you're an inconsiderate person, don't you realise that I was having a barbecue and I was really embarrassed in front of my friends, blah, blah, blah. Um, it's about trying to find that problem-solving approach because quite often the other approach just leads to a sort of flight or fight response. They either start arguing back and say no to whatever you're asking for or they run away and the next time you see them, they run inside again and you actually have trouble even talking about it in the future. So um, yeah. it is very much trying to sort it out and see their point of view. Um, you know, so for example, if I take one matter we had where there was an issue with children throwing a ball against the fence um, mm. It turned out that from one person's point of view, that was obviously very noisy, annoying, and they were concerned about damage to the fence. From the other person's point of view, the children in question were their grandchildren whose um, parent had died recently. And while they didn't condone the ball throwing at that moment in time, they were just so happy to see the kids smiling after this very sad time that they didn't do anything about it. So again, it's the perspective, just trying to understand where people are coming from. Yeah, well, it's interesting because you're saying that because um, that I guess while I say I've got all, all the complaints about my neighbor, he's got some complaints about me. Um, yeah. Particularly, he doesn't like where I put my wheelie bin. So I like to get it right on the edge of the curb because I know the, uh, you know, when the trucks come in and they've got to navigate around parked cars, um, the closer you get it to the, to the edge of the curb, the better it is. Um, but he's uh, had a go at me because he thinks I've, I've pushed it too close to his, um, his driveway. And I was wondering, Michael, is there, are there once again, are there rules around that? Um, yes, Barry, so, um, typically you'll find that a local law will regulate the placement of a wheelie bin. It's 
you'll find that typically they're not um, identical from one council. Those provisions are not identical from one council to another. Um, local laws are, are, are designed to address local issues uh, more so than um, what state or federal laws do. So in that context, um, you will find that one council will have a certain, certain laws relating to wheelie bins, others will not necessarily have something that contradicts it, but they may have more or less of those types of uh, controls that regulate them. So um, it would be appropriate to actually approach council to understand, well, what, what, is, what laws do apply here? Um, and what what is the situation? Um, because then you can work out what might be what might be um, available in terms of remedies. All right, because yeah, I think at the moment his remedy is simply to um, dump dog poo, probably from Chubby, um, into my bin uh, as soon as the bins are cleared. Yeah, uh, <laughs> it's um, and that's that's a little bit tricky. Uh, it's clear if the local law provides for those circumstances. So a local law can say that uh, you can't put something in the waste bin of that's been allocated to a particular resident unless you've got that resident's consent. But not all local laws have that particular control. So you would then it then falls back to littering under the Environment Protection Act. Now littering. Um, is a little bit tricky in that it may or may not be littering depending on the circumstances. Right. Now, if it's straight out someone putting dog poo in the bin um, in, in, uh, without putting a ruling on that, it, it may or may not be an, an offence against the Act. And, and I, I can, I mean, in essence, I would say it's not uh, a breach of the law because the bin is there for the purposes of of um, containing waste. However, it, it gets a little bit tricky. So um, you need to look at each each situation with you know with the full circumstances available, not just not just in part. And so, given these circumstances, a little bit skinny. Um, so I, I would not perhaps commit to whether or not it's it's littering or not. Yeah. And again, I guess it's hard because I haven't actually seen him do it. I just see a bag of dog food with the bottom of my bin. I don't know whose dog poo it is. Um, and Sarah, I mean, I think that might be some, sometimes that's the problem too, is that people can make assumptions that their neighbour has done some act or action and immediately puts a connection together. Oh, we've had a discussion about the bin. My neighbour's got a dog. Therefore, they're the person who's done that. Yeah, and we, we get that quite a lot. I suppose it's natural that you kind of think, oh, you know, if, if I'm upset about this, then perhaps they're doing this deliberately. Quite often though, the two things aren't necessarily connected. You know, they might have the same complaint. They might say someone's been doing the same thing, thing with us. So again, having that two-way discussion of saying, look, I've been finding this happening after my bins have been emptied. Have you noticed anything? One, it might be that they say, yeah, actually I've had the same problem. And so was, you know, so-and-so from number three down the road. Um, alternatively, if it was actually them doing that, just that mention of it might be enough to actually get them to stop. Um, so you may actually resolve your problem just by mentioning it without having to actually make an accusation which may turn out to be wrong. All right, okay. So um, we've kind of come to the end of the, the problems that I've got and I've noticed um, our chat and our Q&A is, is empty at the moment. So what I might do is um, just think about, uh, ask uh, what would happen if I, pursue this down each track. So, um, Michael, if I was to make a complaint to the council about a barking dog um, and dog poo in the bin uh, and take that kind of action, what are your expectations on me as a complainant? What, what do I need to do to, um, to take this forward, generally as a process? Certainly, look, particularly in the case of a barking dog matter or, or a, a noise matter, uh, they typically involve uh, quite a, a focused uh, investigation, uh, in uh, including a, a fairly significant commitment from the affected party that 
they may have to keep uh, written logs of the frequency uh, and other circumstances uh, that give rise to the, the nuisance. Uh, they may also, uh, or council may um, set up recordings, audio and visual. Uh, the person may be required to make a statement and, uh, and I suppose more importantly, they'd be required to perhaps attend court hearings to, as a witness to give evidence. Uh, so print, in principle, they're, they're probably the, the main things. Yeah. Um, and so that's, that's a fair bit of investment for me. And presumably, too, it would help if there were other neighbours who made similar complaints and also provided that um, evidence. That, that becomes uh, important in terms of corroborating uh, the allegation uh, that, that you're making, uh, if you were the, the, the principal complainant. So that other source of evidence becomes really important. Right. So I've accidentally raised my hands, I was checking comments. Um, so uh, Sarah, so by contrast, if that was the way and I had the conversation, I didn't really get a satisfactory response from my neighbor. If I was gonna go down the dispute settlement center service approach, what, uh, what would be the expectations on me? What would be the next steps if it was, you know, to proceed to something like mediation? Yeah. So what we would do is first have a fairly detailed phone conversation with you about what's happened to get an idea of the background and also the relationship that you've got or haven't got with your neighbour. So try and get an understanding there. We would then send a fairly um, plain, I suppose, letter to your neighbour just saying that you've contacted us about an issue of concern. It would explain that we don't represent one person or the other but that we would, um, we, we provide free services trying to assist people in resolving disputes and we would then invite them to contact us. Assuming that they contacted us, quite often there'll be two things that happen. Either they say, I know what this is about. I want to tell you all about my side, which is fine. We would say, that's great. Please do tell us because we are interested to understand the, the position from both sides. If they don't know, we would give them an idea of what you had said to us about the issue. So we would agree on something that we're going to say to them when they ring us. Um, if they were then agreeable to attending mediation, we would then try and arrange it as quickly as possible, subject obviously to mediator's availability and the availability of the parties. At the moment, most of our mediations have been done by telephone, which actually probably makes it a little easier and probably means that more people tend to agree to mediation sometimes uh, when we hold face-to-face -face ones, the thought of walking into the room and sitting, you know, face-to-face -face with the, the person you're in dispute with can be a bit confronting. So it's actually working pretty well. Um, at the mediation, there would be a nationally accredited mediator whose role is not to make a decision, not to tell anyone they're right or they're wrong, but to help facilitate that discussion in a respectful way. Um, so they would start off generally by having a joint discussion where they get each party to outline the issues from their point of view. They would then allow some discussion on those items where people could potentially ask questions and if the other party wished to, they can answer. They would then have what we call a private session where they talk to each party separately just to see whether they've learned any information which might give them some new thoughts on the matter. And then we would start to look at where do we go from here? Um, and it's a matter of the people themselves generating the options because they know their own circumstances. There's no point in me saying, well, I think this is a great solution because it's not my problem. I'm, I'm not the one living with the consequences. So the mediator would, would encourage parties to generate options. If they reach agreement, the mediator can help prepare a written agreement. Um, sometimes people don't want that and that's fine. If they can't agree, then they've still got whatever legal options and other options they had before they started that process. Right. Now, I'm actually, uh, we've got about four or five questions coming through on Q&A now um, and some on comments too, which is great. Um, so just on that one, because we had a question about the success rate of mediation. Yep. So um, generally, um, we have about an 85% success rate at mediation. Um, having said that, obviously, you know, sometimes say to people, I can't tell you if you'll be in the 15 or the 85 um, and the other thing is that depend, you know, there's a great variety in what that agreement looks like. Sometimes the people have only been able to agree on a particular way forward. Sometimes they've literally agreed on a whole lot of stuff and they walk out 
or in this case, hang up with the phone, phone mediations, actually with a whole new relationship and saying, that's great, let's get together and talk about some other stuff too. So there's a range of outcomes, but in 85% of the, the matters we deal with, we get a resolution of the, the issue that you know, was brought to us to begin with. And also know that it's been a while since we've done this, but the actual compliance rate is reported compliance rate. And we surveyed people about this was about 80% because usually the agreements are very immediate and effective actions. And so people have gone through that whole process knowing, well, this is going to be the best deal in the circumstances. So they put that commitment. I think the, um, the proviso that we always say to people is that the actual resolution rate of all matters where we approach people is lower because, uh, you know, it is a voluntary process and there are some people who don't engage at all. And, uh, but we always say to people, it's free. And if it works, you get really great outcomes. So it's worth trying that first. And it's worth probably trying it earlier rather than later, because once things get entrenched and people invested money in legal processes, uh, their options uh, to find a good win-win outcome are, are more limited. Now, there was a, a couple of questions. One came in the chat and one came in on the question A about um, tree roots and tree roots that invade sewerage, but they could also um, create issues with pathways and uh, cracks in buildings. Um, and I know that's, that's a, a broad topic, but um, uh, is it much different from what we're talking about with the other kind of nuisance with tree leaves and... Yeah, so it still falls into pretty much the same category. There may be a couple of other legal avenues, but the issue with mostly, with all of them is one, you have to pursue them through the courts and that's expensive. Secondly, mm. you have to show that it was those tree roots that caused the issue. Um, and quite often that's not as easy as it seems. Um, sometimes it might be um, that there are other tree roots that have caused the issue or that pipes have cracked because of ground movement due to you know drying out because there's been a drought etc so to actually get the evidence to show that it was that particular tree that did it in yes. itself will be quite expensive you'll need expert evidence and so forth so again a practical solution is probably better so you can in the same way that you can trim overhanging branches you can trim um, roots on your side of the fence however I guess there's a couple of considerations which is depending on the way the tree's positioned, is it going to destabilize the tree? Is it going to cause actually damage, actually cause damage to the tree? Because although you can perform self-help, you can't cause damage to the tree. And obviously you don't really want it falling into your yard because you've destabilized it with no roots on that side. So you may need to look at getting an arborist's report before you do that. There are also things like root barriers that can be installed that would stop it then growing back um, if you have manage to trim them back right yeah and again i was thinking the other thing about the cause is you know is depends on when the neighbor moved in and whether you know <laughs> they looked after through whether this damage happened even before they took possession of the property so there's a number of variables that you need to take into account with yeah and lots of rules around to you know if there was something simple that you could have done to minimize the damage you may be expected to do oh, that as well so yeah the there, there's quite, it's quite a complicated area <laughs> Yeah. Um, and can I just mention, sorry, David, um, if you come to us, we certainly encourage you to get advice if you feel you want to, because that way you know what you're dealing with. So if you deal with us, we're not saying don't go and get legal advice, by all means get it if you can, because that helps you work out, well, what are my options and what's my best yeah. option in the circumstances? Yeah, and I think it makes a difference if you think, oh, there's a quick fix, there'll be somebody who can come over here and slap a fine and get the tree ripped out versus, oh, no, it's an expensive and long process. Um, I need to know that when I talk to my neighbour about uh, how forceful I can be in my negotiations. Mm. I guess I'd say to being forceful in the negotiation isn't necessarily the best way to get what you True. want. Um, again, it's about pushing people into a corner. Um, if you give them the chance to feel they're making a decision, they might have a whole lot of options, all of which are really unattractive. But if they make the decision, you'll find that they're, you're actually likely to get a better result. That's true. That's true. Um, speaking of all, somebody else has got a, a question here about a neighbour who put up a fence without their consent. So there was no communication. There must have been a non-resident owner. Um, and then they agreed to pay for half. But the question is, legally, did they have to? 
So the Act sets out a process that you should follow when you're putting up a fence, um, which involves serving that notice to fence if you, you know, haven't been able to reach agreement. Um, if they didn't follow that process, then potentially there's an argument that they shouldn't have put it up um, and they should have, uh, and, and there is a, a provision in the Fences Act which theoretically allows you to apply to the court to reinstate the position that was there. So you'd be asking for the fence to be pulled down. I honestly don't know whether a court's likely to do that. They might, um, you know, it would, it would be probably unusual circumstances, but, but again, that would be a court decision. I guess, again, it's a matter of talking to your neighbour, just understanding what happened. Sometimes they might have served a notice um, on a previous, the previous owner. Sometimes they might not have been able to get the current details and they have served a notice, it's just it hasn't gone where it should have gone. Um, and in some cases in new developments, they might have been told by the developer that they can do exactly what they've done. So in a sense, they've been misled by someone else and they've faithfully gone and done what they thought they could do without realising. Um, even if they haven't served the notice when they should, we would say, think about the relationship into the future you know, how much is involved, if it's not a whole lot, um, maybe it's better to say, well, look, I, you don't actually have the right to claim this, but nevertheless, because we're neighbours and we want a good relationship, I'm prepared to contribute something because that's likely then to lead to a better relationship into the future. Okay. Now we have one more question about um, security cameras. And I know this is something that often comes up because um, one person feels that you know, they put up a security camera for a particular reason, like they might have had some burglaries or something, so they direct that down their driveway and the other neighbour looks at the angle of that and goes, no, I think they're spying on me. Um, again, is that a council kind of thing, Michael? Is that something that council have local laws around or is it a... More of a, um, a matter um, for police. Mm. The, these um, Surveillance Devices Act really controls the use of CCTV footage and, and the like. And so it's a, there's, the Act actually stipulates a, a number of authorities that have jurisdiction under that Act, um, one of which, and the most common, is, is the police. So, um, so the application and interpretation of the Act uh, sits really um, with the police in, in a domestic sense of that nature. Right. And I think for us often it... Um comes to us in situations where people have applied for uh, personal safety intervention orders against each other and um, maybe, you know, an order has been placed as an application on foot and uh, sometimes that's one of the, the complaints people have is that they think the neighbour is spying and it, it can be a thing of perception. Yes, absolutely. Uh, okay. Now, there's another one about... This is a very specific question, so... Um, I'll try and de-identify it, but somebody had a, um, a large in-ground pool and they must have used a crane so it went over their property before they lowered it down. And uh, when they asked the council about this, they didn't have a, a clue about this issue. Um, so I guess there's, there's a question about um, when people are doing renovations and works, are there requirements for them to be mindful of the, the neighbour. And then when you've got something like this, where I guess it doesn't touch your property, it's just lifted over your property, is that a requirement? I would have thought like, and I know it's more probably more in the building area, but... Local laws don't control the use of cranes. Um, and it gets... Uh, the use of cranes in those circumstances and the invasion of space and trespass and those sorts of things can be very technical. Mm -hmm. um, typically, it's not local laws. Uh, it may um, it may be a matter that you'll, you know, if you were to consult a lawyer or get your own legal advice, would be my suggestion uh, would be to follow that pathway um, as to whether or not uh, it's controlled by building controls. I'm not sure that it is. Uh, but my, my strong advice would be to get the consultant yeah. lawyer or, or legal services um, in, in your local local council area. Yeah. yeah, I think what I was more referring to is sometimes you know, when people are doing building works, they get a building permit and there are conditions around protection of neighbouring property and that kind of thing. Um, but whether that would cover the use of a, a crane over a backyard, um, 
is a separate question, I guess. Yeah, and there's yeah. probably things, WorkSafe and other authorities that might have involvement in something like that. Yeah, I agree. Um, you, you may wish to consult WorkSafe and it's, it's not a, um, a bad avenue to pursue. Um, damage that's caused, all right, is, is, a, is, a, is a different question again. Um, and not really a, a council, not really a council matter. Um, generally, um, you can always consult council, but again, it would be uh, in your interest to consult your own legal advice. Yeah, I think private legal, because if, if I guess the thing is, if there's no damage, no harm done, but if there is damage, certainly somebody would be responsible. Yes. To, um, I mean, I wouldn't have thought, again, it is the legal area, I wouldn't have thought that having any permits allows people to access to your property without your agreement generally. But at the end of the day, what we'd encourage you to think about too is it may not have been the, the owner of the property who made that decision. Quite often you've got builders and subcontractors and so forth, and they don't have direct control over what's happening. So while you might feel very upset that this has happened, um, your neighbour might feel equally aggrieved that they're being accused of, of doing this when in fact they didn't even know it was occurring or, or you know it wasn't something they were expecting to occur. So again, that conversation would probably be the starting point because it's certainly something that people quite often feel strongly about having people access on or through their property without their permission. But it may be something that you need to flag with the neighbour first so they're even aware of it and can investigate and, and find out what the situation was. Okay. Well, I think that's the end of the, uh, the questions that people have had for us. So um, I'd like to thank everybody for listening. Uh, as uh, hopefully uh, you threw out a discussion and see that, you know, we often, often things are matters that have an element of needing to consult the, the council or something like a tree. We need to check if there's tree protection works, but also um, a lot of it is, is an exercise of negotiation with the neighbours. So, um, the more you can do to build up the relationship before you have the issues, the much easier it is to resolve it when you have a, a difficult question to ask. So I'd like to thank our panellists again. Thank you, uh, Michael, for tuning in from City of Monash. And thank you, Sarah, for coming in from Hume Region. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, everyone who listened in. Thank you. Um, end the session now. Bye. Thank you. Bye.